days that you just don't want to get up in the morning. For me, it was because I woke up and realized that I'm probably having an allergic reaction to the glue on the nose strips that I use sometimes when I go to sleep if my nose feels really swollen. So I had to go and make sure that I had enough makeup on that it didn't look like I wanted to talk a little bit about being young. And there are so many different takes that I can go with that, and I'm sure I'll talk about this again sometime. But the direction I want to go in is some of the struggles that you face being young. And a little bit more into depth, specifically the issues facing millennials. So if you haven't figured this out from any of the other videos and any of the times I've mentioned it, I am considered a millennial. And as much as my husband hates it, so is he. <laughs> so millennial is just a word that is used to describe people born in a certain year. So the generation of us. And we are known as millennials. Uh, for the most part, it's considered between 1990 and 2000. Some people cut it a little bit earlier. Some people go a little later. So, But for the most part, that is the years that we were born. And it is used to describe us, and a lot of the times it's used to describe people of a generation because they are growing up with very similar experiences and circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that we all were raised the same, it just means that we all grew up in the same world, so more or less we have a similar upbringing. So like, uh, technology was booming, so some of us still remember a time before computers, some of us remember the really old computers. If you play the dial-up noise, almost all of us cringe because you know what that is, and it is horrible. <laughs> we all have nightmares about this. <laughs> but we were all still young during this time, so it's not a very prominent memory because we also remember flat screen, plasma, LED, and all of the amazing stuff that's come since then, and laptops now, they're tiny, and when the little netbooks that were like this big came out and everybody realized they're really not that good <laughs> because as much as they have you know the travel size there's not a lot you can do on it and rise the netbook and all of, all of this technology stuff that happened um but another thing that defines us is kind of the generation before our parents and there was a lot of stuff happening at that time that kind of changed a lot of what we grew up with. So I, I'm not going to try to copy this guy because he did a really great talk on it. I might share it later if I can find it. But he kind of covered a lot of the problems with millennials. And it was real problem versus the problems that everybody likes to label us with. So I'm sure you all have seen all of the headlines that are uh, millennials are killing the diamond market. They're killing the housing market. Why won't they buy stuff? Why are they always being lazy? What is it with their avocado toast? And all sorts of very weird headlines that I still don't 100% understand. A lot of this is not phrased correctly or gives us any sort of good light. So personally, as a millennial, let me answer some of these. Why are we killing the housing market? We're not trying to. We would all love to buy a house. I talked about it earlier. We have this duplex that we live in, but we're talking about buying a house. So it's not a, we hate houses, it's that they're ridiculously expensive. And in order to qualify for a good loan to get a house, you need to have good credit. And a lot of us are struggling to pay off debt. That isn't always our fault. Credit card debt? Yeah, some of us should have had better financial education. Not all of us knew what we were getting into. That's still our fault. Student loan debt. That affects our credit score because there are loans that are taken out in our name. We were all really young trying to chase this idea that we were told that college degree is going to be what sets you apart from everybody else and that is what's going to get you the job to earn the money to get the house, to get the loans, to get the credit, and all of that stuff. However, nobody really told us how to do it, and not all of us qualified for scholarships. Or if you did qualify for scholarships, you didn't get enough of it. So when I was in college, I needed a little bit more money at some point because I wanted to do some stuff, and I took out some college loans. Fortunately, I really had to think hard about it. My parents were, and still are, really smart and kind of talked to me about it and all pros and cons. And I really don't have that much student loan debt. I 
think last time I checked, I probably have less than 10,000. Because that's right around what I borrowed. And I've been paying it off. And it hasn't always been easy. But I can't really pay it off any quicker because I've been struggling to keep a job for a long period of time for different reasons in every single one of them. But it's made it hard to make bigger payments or additional payments to pay it off faster. I've just been making my payments. I added a little bit since I started paying them off and I pay a little bit more every month towards the principal so that way they go down. And if you don't understand what a principal is, please talk to somebody with money because or who knows anything about money, financial advisor, because that's kind of important. <laughs> but doing things that I can to pay those down, but those affect my credit score. The credit card that I took out that I didn't really use very smartly and ended up with a little bit of credit card debt could have been worse. It's not the worst case and it's the only one that I have and we're paying that one down as well. But there's a lot of things that we do to do the things that everyone says that we need to do. So college is expensive. We take out student loans so that we can finish paying for college. College costs have skyrocketed since our grandparents went to college. They always tell these stories about, yeah, I used to work a part-time job and I paid for all of my college. Well, if you read any of the articles or look up any of the information of how much it costs to go to college versus what the minimum wage was and all of the different comparisons of what they were more than likely making doing minimum wage part-time and then what college was cost, it looks really reasonable. Like you could probably do that. And then you worked a full-time job after you got out and you were able to buy the house and were able to buy the car and live well and have one of the parents stay at home, which was usually the woman, but we're not getting into that today. But there was all of this that we could do and that is exciting and you want to do that. And when you're growing up, that's what you're hearing. So you're like, cool, that's what I want. That's what I want to do. And you're doing it. And it's not the same. I remember there was one semester in college that I was doing 16 hours, which is the max hours that you can take. I was working two part-time jobs and working a ridiculous amount of hours. And I was also doing stage management at the time, two different plays that semester. So I was doing that in my spare time. So I would get up, I would go to school, I would go to work, or let's see, that more I think it was getting up, I went immediately to the elementary school that I was an assistant with, and I was there for four hours. And then I would leave, and I would go to class. And I would be in class for most of the day, and then I would leave, and then I would go to work where I was a waitress, and I would waitress for my shift, and then I got off of work, and then I would go back to the university, and I would do the rehearsal hours and sit down with the director afterwards and make sure that we had everything together and doing all of the notes and what do I have to send out and what do I have to do, managing, and then I would go home and pass out. And I did that for like five months, six months, more or less. I was running and I still had to do student loans. I still had to rely on my scholarships because I was not going to make the money that I needed to pay for my school, to pay for my gas, to pay for my food. And that's because I was still living at my parents' house. So I didn't even have to buy groceries or pay rent. I just had to buy the food that I needed to eat when I was out of the house. So lunch and sometimes dinner. And that's because I also got discounts where I worked because I was working at a restaurant. <laughs> and I still needed money to pay for school that everyone keeps telling you, well, you should be working harder. I was working really hard and I still needed that extra little bump of cash. So getting out of school had this idea, I was going to go, I was going to find the job, and I was going to do the thing, and I was going to make the money, and I was going to pay everything off, and it was going to be grand. I still haven't paid everything off. It's been three years since I got out of college, two years since I moved to San Antonio, and it's still not what I thought it was going to be. Granted, a lot of other amazing things have happened. I met my husband, I got married, he happened to have had a better degree than me, and got the job that he needed and he got his house and he's we're not gonna talk about cars but we have all of the stuff and we're doing fine but it's still so 
frustrating to see why are we killing the housing market? Why are we killing the diamond market? What is up with that avocado toast? First of all, comparatively speaking, avocado toast versus buying a diamond, the price jump is obscene. Yeah, avocados are expensive, but there are, what, at worst, a dollar for the cheap Haas avocados versus like the large ones, which are almost always like a dollar, dollar fifty. You are trying to compare us buying a slice of bread and a dollar fifty avocado altogether, which is probably three dollars. If you want to go buy pricey bread, maybe five. And that's not just one toast, that's several toasts to buying thousands of dollars in diamonds. Yeah, sorry. We would love to buy diamonds, they're beautiful, but they're also not necessary and they're really expensive. And if we can't even afford to go to school, pay rent, pay light bills, pay electric bills, pay gasoline, figure out if you're gonna inherit a car or buy a car and usually a cheap used car if you can't inherit one or if you are inheriting one, still a cheap used one. There are so many more necessary expenses than buying things like a diamond in a house. So most people would still love to buy a house because in the long run it's a little bit cheaper than going to rent for the rest of your life because you're still, you're probably going to pay about what a house is going to cost if you rent for the rest of your life. However, you still have to live somewhere and if you don't have the option to live at home and save up the money that you need and get a good credit score to buy the house, renting is going to be your best option. And so you're spending anywhere between like 500 to a couple thousand a month to rent. And I'm getting 500 because that was some of the cheapest living spaces in the Rio Grande Valley where the cost of living is a lot lower. Here in San Antonio, I looked really hard for the cheapest apartment I could possibly find that was livable. I was paying probably 650 a month. That's for a one bedroom, not very big, didn't include light, didn't include internet, it included water and trash. And it didn't include water, it just, I would get charged water on my bill. Yeah. So we're paying that every month for as long as we live there. And then you expect us to put aside an additional set of money to go and buy a house Sorry, that wasn't going to happen. I was going to need to figure out a way to get up there in what I was making a month to even consider doing that. I was still living fairly month to month. I was able to put about $25 a month away in my savings account. That adds up, but it doesn't add up very quickly. So when you're calling us lazy and entitled, yeah, I'm sure there's some of us that are, but it's not all of us. And it's really offensive when you walk in and people just assume that, oh, she's young, she's going to be lazy, she's going to be entitled, she's not going to work hard, she's going to try to take advantage of the situation. And it's like, no, I'm going to go in and I'm going to work my butt off. Would I love to have an upper level job where I can actually make enough money to think about buying a house? Yeah, I would love that. But... I also don't mind starting at an entry level position even though it's not going to pay me for my degree so that I can try to work my way up. But if you expect me to stay there for a really long time with my degree, I'm sorry I'm going to look for better opportunities because I need to make enough money to pay for my bills and minimum wage is just not going to cut it. And a lot of people get really upset and really frustrated about, well, the minimum wage is set for a reason and why are we going to bump up minimum wage and why are we going to do all of this stuff when other people, like trained professionals, don't make that much. I'm not saying I want to make more than a trained professional. If, you know, if you're entry level, you're just saying that you want to be able to go to the grocery store and not worry that your card is going to get declined. And just because minimum wage is going to get raised doesn't mean that you're trying, you know, somebody who's flipping burgers is trying to make the same amount as somebody who's riding in an ambulance saving lives. 
they might not, you know, they don't have the same importance. One of them is a necessity. One of them is, well, I kind of would like to not cook today. But why can't they make more too? Ambulances are ridiculously expensive. If they're not going to pay the professionals who are there to save your life, then who are they going to? There's just so much else going on than just us trying to be lazy and entitled. And I'm really going to have to look for this talk that this guy gave because he explained it so well. That there was just so much going into our upbringing that changed the way we perceive things. Participation awards became a thing. And we were awarded for simply participating. Not necessarily doing well. Not necessarily even trying. Participating. So, yes, that develops a certain level of entitlement. Because, well, I participated. I did my job. Where is my raise? Where is my applause? We didn't get to choose any of the things that make up our surroundings. We don't get to pick the parents who raise us or how they choose to raise us. We don't get to pick the teachers what they're like or what the environment is like. We just get to grow up in it and deal with the cards that were dealt. I got lucky. My parents are amazing and they raised us really well and they taught us as much as they could and to this day they help us. I can call up my mom today and say, hey, I need a little bit of extra cash or I need help or I don't know what I'm doing or I'm trying to figure out how to change my name. Where do I go? What do I do? And she'd help me. Not everybody has that option. Some people come from young single parents who maybe would love to help their kids but can't because they can't afford it. Some people come from broken homes. Some people are coming out of the foster system without anybody to guide them and are forced to figure it out on their own and if they're lucky they get mentors not all of us have the same opportunities my parents always told us you don't have to be first place you have to do your best and if you're doing your best that's all that counts because you're doing everything you can and that helped us grow up to be better people I don't assume that I'm entitled to the higher up position. Would I love it? Yeah, because I worked hard for it. I went to four years of college, getting internships, doing jobs that maybe I didn't always want to do, but to get the experience I needed, to learn, to take it all in. And I've always worked hard in every job that I'm in, and I always put in that extra effort because to me, at the end of the day, if I'm doing my best work, I can stand and be proud of myself. And I'm always open to learning and to changing. And usually people will recognize it. A lot of the times people take it for granted because the way that our mentality has grown is that everyone is expendable and everybody is replaceable. And after I left one of my jobs because I was doing so much more than what the job entitled or what it said it was supposed to be, that I wanted a little bit more money for my work. I wanted to be recognized for all of the hard work that I was putting into this because I was still living paycheck to paycheck, but yet somehow I was supposed to be lucky. So I was doing all this work and I wanted more. And they let me go. So I left and I went and looking for it. And I've heard since then that they asked me to go back because other people aren't me. Because I actually take a lot of pride in my work and I don't mind going the extra mile but they thought I was replaceable. And they didn't re realize that I really wasn't easily replaceable until after. This isn't a moment to brag or to try to make myself look better. This is so that you can kind of see that it's not easy being a millennial because I'm young, because I'm supposed to be entitled, because I'm supposed to be lazy. I'm not. I work hard and I try hard and I want to earn the things that I have. But if I'm expected to bend over backwards and be grateful for it, no. <laughs> I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to do this vlog. I'm grateful that I have an amazing husband who's okay with me staying home right now. I'm grateful for parents who taught me to be a hard worker and to do my best. And if I'm going to be staying home, that I'm going to make it worth it. That I'm going to save money by always cooking and cleaning and doing the extra work that we don't have to pay somebody else to do. 
I'm going to be grateful for the things that make my life easier. Why should I be grateful that you hired me to do a job? Maybe if you gave me a great opportunity. Maybe if you, you know, gave me this other thing that makes it easier or you actually recognize that I can do a job and compensated me for it. I'll be grateful for good opportunities. But if you want me to be scrubbing the floor and paying me almost nothing and tell me to be grateful, that's really hard to do for anybody. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about millennials and just kind of why these issues frustrate us so much. And if you have any questions, ask me. If you want to have a debate about it and see where I need to grow or get better, I would love to get your opinion on this and see where I'm going wrong or grow more as a person. I'm not saying I have all the answers and I'm not saying that I'm perfect or that anything that I've said today is the ultimate answer. I'm just saying that this is how I feel and this is my views as a millennial. Thanks for listening.